Hi folks, this is uh, Richard Hall here and uh, we're going to be looking at the night sky and uh, You're up? Yeah, I think I think I'm okay. <laughs> Do you want me to get someone to check? Yes, I think the uh, night sky. Here we are. We're on there. Okay, I think we're on there. But the, uh, the little things for the uh, <laughs> what we're showing them. I've lost the screen. <laughs> Keep talking. I know. I know. You I will. It was on there. there go. Now I've got it right. Okay. Hello, folks. Sorry about that. <laughs> It's, 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 very, it's very, very early in the morning at the moment. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm, I'm Richard and also we've got Kay with me. Uh, we're both from Stonehenge RTRO. I'm going to be taking through our fabulous night sky that we have at the moment. Uh, also, the, this program has always been sponsored by Dan Broughton of Wairapa Web Design. So thank you, Dan, for that. And I think astronomy is one of the most important of, of sciences because... Um, it's something that goes back so far back in time. It was the original things of people learnt about the seven stars to give them timekeeping, navigation and so on and so forth, studying the heavens. But of course they were always a great mystery to our ancestors, just these lights up in the sky. They didn't know what they were at all. So, yeah. Anyway, if we look to the walls of the north, uh, about about 9pm after it's got dark at the moment, um, this is the, for those of you watching TV, this is the panorama stars you will see. And we've got a nice big bright star in the sky, which of course is not a star, it's the planet Jupiter. All right, and there it is there. It's absolutely awesome objects. And um, I've just brought up on the screen uh, Jupiter and the Earth to scale. Um, you could fit uh, th the mass alone, 318 Earths uh, equal one Jupiter. OK, uh, so it is a, a colossal star. And th these giant planets are actually quite common, we now know. Uh, we find them just about around most stars uh, when we've actually able to detect worlds around them. If, of course, they're easier to see than the little ones. Well, absolutely. But what I mean is that, uh, our Jupiter is not something really weird and out of focus and so on. Um, and But it's, it's a world that's totally unlike the Earth. Uh, we never see the surface of, of, of Jupiter. Uh, the markings that we can see um, are clouds. And, um, for example, the most famous thing that appears to be almost permanent is the Great Red Spot. Um, it's actually a cyclone that's been blasting away for about 150 years. It's so big it could swallow the Earth. You know? But there's no friction, is there? So mm. there's nothing actually to sort of slow it down. No, it's just, it's just that things are on such a scale. Uh, and when we when we look at the clouds, the, the white and dark brown clouds, they're all at different levels and so on. Uh, if we went inside there, of course, what we'd end up with is eventually uh, going down and eventually it turns into a liquid. Right? Hydrogen, is it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, probably methane and things methane. like that, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, yeah, so for those of you watching on TV, you can see it orbits it, the planet changing and as it rotates on its axis. It's a giant planet, but it rotates on its axis in, in a matter of hours um, compared to the, our Earth. And uh, indeed, if you're watching it through a telescope, quite after a short period of time, you realise that the things on it are changing position. And also the cloud tops that we're looking at, they also appear to be changing as well. OK, now, Jupiter has got 95 moons. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember when they said a much smaller number than that. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, so it is like it is like a, a, a solar system on its own. And indeed, if we look at the composition of Jupiter, it's actually far more like the sun than it is the Earth. And indeed, Jupiter radiates more energy than it receives from the sun. So in a sense, it's a dark star. Right? So it just isn't big enough to ignite. Yeah, no, no, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there'd be a few nuclear reactions at the centre, but nothing on a grand scale. It's, the mass is too small to reach that stage, although it's a giant planet. Now, of those 95 moons, of course, four of them, uh, the Galilean ones, uh, can be seen with a pair of binoculars. Um, 
and from night to night you see them changing their position as they orbit around the uh, plane of, the, of Jupiter itself. So those are the Galilean moons. And they, indeed those Galilean moons, in a sense, we call them moons, they're actually more like planets than anything else. Mm. Yeah. And they're called that because they were found by Galileo, who's that, basically the person that we think invented the modern telescope. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's he got right. himself into a lot of trouble. Yeah. And when we say 95 moons, you've got to remember that this, this vast number has only been discovered since the uh, space age and the use of satellites which can observe uh, Jupiter and much Hubble closer. and yeah. things like that. And things yeah. like that, yeah. Right, okay. But now, Jupiter's not the only planet that we've got in the sky at the moment, a uh, giant planet. There's also the planet Saturn. Um, not quite so easily to pick, as you can see f watching this on TV, is it, it is a, appears like a bright star in the sky, but it's not a remarkably bright star, okay? And certainly not like Jupiter is at the moment. And so Jupiter, uh, Saturn again is what we call a gas giant, the same as um, Jupiter. So we've got these two giant worlds, um, and uh, I think Saturn's about 95 times the, the mass of the Earth or something like that. It's, it's a colossal planet. But of course, what makes it so well known is the fact that it's got rings. And of course, Jupiter's got rings as well, but they're just not as bright and as brilliant as that. In addition to those, those rings, it too has got a colossal number of worlds orbiting around it, moons. So in very in, in many respects Saturn is simply a slightly smaller version of Jupiter. Okay? Yeah, if you look at some of those smaller ones, they call them moons, but they look, look more like asteroids, don't they? Oh, undoubtedly some of them mm. probably are. If you look at either there. end of that yeah, closer to right. they just look like asteroids that have got captured. Mm, mm. Whereas the other ones actually do look like worlds. I mean, they're kind of round and and they've got uh, events obviously happened, you know, because they've got craters and stuff like that, some of them, or they've got gas around them like Titan, you yeah. know. Well, and of course, the difference is also these days with the, the space exploration, we're being able to, we can make a lot of assumptions of what the surface of a world might be like, but um, we begin to discover what the nature of these surfaces, these moons are, and in most cases, they are absolutely mind-boggling compared with what they thought they were. So if you look at, you know, going back to Jupiter, uh, you've got Io there, it's got Caesar sulphur, it's a volcanic world and it's got more volcanoes than any other planet on the solar system. They're all, there's all, there's real mysteries in a lot of them. I mean, Titan we've taken spacecraft to, mm. so we know a bit about it, but Iapetus there has got black and white. Yeah. They're really marked black and yeah. white colouring, and they're still, <clears throat> as far as I know, still trying to get to totally to grips with why it's mm. so much so like that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It looks like those. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. And Titan has always been an object. It's it's the I guess it's the biggest moon in the solar system. It's the size of a small planet, and uh, it's always been of interest to astronomers because it has an atmosphere which can be detected from Earth. See, our moon is an airless world. And when, we, when I use the word moon, you tend to think of a, 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 a world like the moon, airless world with craters on it. Yes, you can see some others there. Yeah. Mimas and Tethys yeah, that so have got the, lots of craters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Titan itself is an absolutely awesome world. And uh, while many of those worlds that orbit around Saturn are indeed a bit like our moon, all right, well some of them are a little bit different and the most important of those is Titan right? and it has got an atmosphere and it's also got uh, seas now for those of you looking at this on TV you can see those dark areas they've actually seas on on Titan but they are not seas of water you see as we move out of the solar system the composition of things tends to change those seas that we can see there are liquid methane and so, so what and is ammonia. a gas for us yeah is a liquid, liquid by the time you get the, out there at those low temperatures yeah, yeah and some so, of the things that we have that can form like ice water ice become rocks don't they yeah yeah. And I'm showing you an image of the, I believe the surface of Titan is like. But the fascinating thing about Titan is, when we talk about it, um, 
being a, an alien world. Yes, it is. But you see the compounds on the surface and in the atmosphere of, of Titan are biological. Now, I'm not necessarily saying there's life on Titan, all right? <laughs> there's not enough cows to make that many farts. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but it, it, there's these, these organic, organic compounds and it's quite possible that there is some form of primitive life on Titan. And the importance of organic compounds is that they can lead to life, isn't it? Yeah, that they can right. combine, and they did on Earth, and then something sparked that last point at which they started to divide and create life. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And, of course, scientists are absolutely fascinated by this because when we look at that, that big question about life in the universe, what's out there? Well, and up to now, we've only been able to explore one of them in any detail, planet Earth. And if we can find another world like Titan, then we find there's actually life on there. Obviously, we want to know how different it is from life on Earth. But it, this is tending to suggest that life will appear anywhere where the conditions are right. It's suggesting that I remember when I was much younger, the idea that life was seeded everywhere through the organic compounds in those molecular clouds, mm. those ones that make the pretty colours in, in Orion, you know, and stuff like that. When you look through a big telescope and you see those lovely colours, that, that, that within those clouds are the basic building blocks for life. Like, yeah. And that some of them can come in on comets as well. That's right, yeah. Of yeah. course, you see, what, what Kay's really telling you now is that we're still, a lot of what we know about life in the universe is guesswork. We know a lot about life on Earth and the way it evolves, but how does it, how did it start off elsewhere? And so we've got different theories. Mm. And of course, by getting onto worlds like Titan, that we can begin to They're understand. They're doing it that. on Mars too, aren't yeah, they? Yeah. <laughs> yes, they believe that life may continue to exist underneath the crust. You know, the mm. crust on, on Mars is very much thicker than our crust, but somewhere deep down in the crust might be life. Mm. Yeah. You need the atmosphere, folks, you see, because the most deadly thing to uh, living things, of course, is the dangerous radiations from the sun and cosmic radiations yeah. from space, which literally disintegrate uh, organic molecules. So that's why you won't find any life on the surface of, of the moon. But Titan is different because it's got an atmosphere which protects it. So it could have surface. something that we could yeah. find quite easily. That's what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas Mars, we'd have to, we'd have to find evidence of life and then go deeper to find <laughs> life because exactly. we know there's a lot of life under the surface of the Earth. Yeah. And that, in fact, that's what um, scientists want to do is send a spacecraft to Mars and to dig a hole into it, into Mars and and. It, bring back samples to the earth and so on yeah and the reason for that is just what Kay says that see when we when we look at planets we tend to see them in the short period of life time that we've existed on this in this world but we know that worlds evolve all the time our planet is all right you go back a hundred million years ago there were dinosaurs on the earth but the, this abundance of living things on the surface of the earth that you can see without a microscope only goes back to about 20 percent most of the history of the earth before that life just existed in the oceans and for most of the earth's history it was little tiny bacteria and things like that right mm. and so what you've got to realize and that the reason for that is a there's evolving life but there's also evolving conditions on earth exactly the same thing with mars because it's a smaller planet it's evolved more quickly so we do believe that once upon a time and there's a lot of evidence for this there were seas on mars and there were liquid waters we can see the the the, the markings of what was dried up riverbeds and so on uh, channeling mm, the way across. Deltas. Mm. That tells us, well, as the atmosphere is thinned and the volcanic activity on Mars died, if life has existed, as Kay just mentioned, the one place where it could still survive is beneath the surface where it's protected from the, from the solar radiation. 
So we've still got a lot of things to them. But I know that they've found some rocks that actually contain water, don't they? Olivine mm. contains water. Mm. And on Earth, water circulates through the crust. So if it did, and it's still down there, and there's still a bit of warmth from the volcano, or some volcanoes there, or the, something happening at the centre, then you may have some, yeah. some water that's available to life. That's right. Mars, Titan... Mm. In our solar system, could it could supported life or could still support life? Venus may indeed have supported life once. It's it's now it, Venus is an inferno and a hell of a place to go. But a long, literally. long, long <laughs> yeah, literally. But a long, long time ago, it conditions on Venus were more like the Earth. So perhaps life evolved there as well. Now, see, this is important. We're just talking about one star, our sun. When you look out into the Milky Way, it says hundreds of thousands of millions of stars out there, right? And each of those has got worlds, of what we can tell. There's an awful uh, lot of world worlds. I mean, yeah. they, they really believe that there will be, that as we explore, that we'll keep finding a lot of water worlds. Yeah. Not so much worlds like our Earth, um, like I suppose you could call that a water world in some ways, but it's got land sticking out of the water but worlds that have no land sticking out of the water like earth was once mm. like because water is the most important thing mm. as far as colonization as well because we human beings we absolutely depend upon water and if you've yeah. got a that's what makes it life difficult uh, to set up a colony on mar on the moon is the lack of water there but if you've got a world which has got water on it, if there is water in Ma on Mars so beneath the surface, then yes, you could build a colony there because you've got the basic ingredients you need for air, for oxygen. You can break the water down into oxygen and nitrogen, so you've got oxygen, and you've also got water as a drink, yeah. Mm. So all those sorts There's of a lot of ice worlds out there that yeah. may have, you know, liquid underneath the ice. Yeah. Mm, even yeah. in our solar system. Yeah. So this is just one star what we're talking about, the our sun and its worlds. Mm. And there's those millions of others out there. Uh, at the moment, we don't have the technology to discover too much about them. But what I may do exist know, out there? I do know that every single time they send something out, they discover something that they didn't expect. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I can remember when they never, never thought there'd be things um, sort of active on some of these worlds out there in our solar system further mm. out because it was too far away from the energy of the sun. But no, they've got uh, volcanoes and ice jets and all mm. sorts of things that they didn't expect. Yeah. Now going back into our night sky, and we're looking at Jupiter and Saturn, on the horizon in the east, we will see the Pleiades star cluster, which is undoubtedly the, mo the most famous star cluster uh, in the sky. Uh, it contains something in the region of about a thousand stars. Um, they're all young, right? They're baby stars. So, so we, if we're looking for, if we find planets which were undoubtedly will around these stars, uh, they're going to be in a primordial state, possibly where life is maybe evolving now or just pre that, all right? However, f the stars vary in brightness, and with the uh, binoculars or something like that, we can just see about somewhere between six and nine stars these of course are the seven sisters right? i think with very good eyesight you can get up to 11 i've heard yeah yeah mm. they are simply the brightest stars in the group and of course they're very important to us down here because uh, we call them this group of stars matariki and of course when, you, when you're looking out at these stars um looking along the horizon and so on, at right about nine o'clock in the evening, you're seeing the same pageant of stars you would have seen in dawn during June at the time of the beginning of the Māori New Year, right? So we're seeing the stars now in the evening sky. It's that's kind of the universe resetting itself. That's right, yeah. Every year. So that's the Pleiades star cluster, okay? There. Now we turn back to the south and we find that at this time of the year, uh, the Milky Way, which is in winter, is a great pageant across the sky, a great archway, is actually laying along the southern horizon. Consequently, most of the bright stars are, are laying along that, that, that region there. And uh, then we've got the Southern Cross sitting at the, on near the floor, okay? And then we've got 
followed by the two pointer stars. The brighter of them is Alpha Centauri, the nearest star beyond the solar system, which incidentally has got two suns, and we know, already know that they've got planets around those. Then um, in the west, setting in the west, we've got the Scorpion. And they're going up and, but while rising in the east is, is Orion. Now, Scorpius is a sign of winter. Orion is the sign of summer. So the summer stars are coming into the sky. And along with them is the two brightest stars in the sky, true stars, unlike a planet. These are Sirius and Canopus. Sirius, of course, is the brightest of the two. And so they've got this pageant of stars there, right? And they form what is known as the Great Walker of Tamaririty. Well, that's what they're known of down here, aren't they, Kay? Yes, they are. Tamaririty didn't... He was trying to clothe his father because when the two of them were separated, Rangi and Papa, his father was naked. So he was taking the stars into the sky from a large mountain where they were all piled up and taking them up into the sky to make a cloak for his father to cover his nakedness. Got to remember, folks, this is a story she's telling. <laughs> <laughs> well, you prove it isn't. <laughs> and, and Ahutahi, which is Canopus, right, is actually, he's, he's the uh, navigator in charge yes. of the... Ahutahi. Yeah. 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 And then what, the, what, what it says is at the beginning of the year, it, he pulls the anchor up, which is Tipunga, yeah. the Southern Cross, the Southern Cross is the anchor of the Great Walker, and he pulls the anchor up, and then the ship begins to sail across the sky. And of course, that, these are sorts of things you will be observing in the dawn, uh, going back, you know, in, yeah. into people. Genesis, people look at the anchor and say, "Why is it in the middle?" Then, well, just think about it. You've got a long boat. You stick your anchor out one end. What do you think is going to happen to the yeah. boat? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On the on the big walkers, even the multi hole ones, yeah. quite often the anchor was in the middle where it was stable. Yeah, yeah. So that's the great walker, folks. So if it's a nice clear night, go out, you know, early in the evening once it gets dark, have along the southern horizon, and pick out the southern cross, and then see if you can pick out the walker. The prow of the walker is formed by that great curve of stars, which we know as the scorpion, all right? And at the back end of the prow, at the prow uh, we've got at the back end of the boat, of course, we've got Orion as well, all right? So those are something to have a look at. Right, now we've gone back to the north, and looking to the north, we've got, of course, as well as uh, Jupiter and, that, and Saturn there, we've got the Great Square. It's made up of four relatively bright stars, but because there's not many other, it's well away from the Milky Way, there's not many other bright stars, so the, the Great Square stands out quite well. And the stars around the Great Square and above that in China are known as the White Tiger of Autumn. So there's a constellation you've never seen before. However, having said that's the White Tiger of Autumn, of course the, it would have to be the White ti Tiger of Spring down here, wouldn't it? Yeah. 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 So there's the great tiger in the sky. Now, going back, coming down from the uh, right, bottom right star, we see a hazy patch of light. And here, of course, we're looking at the most distant object that can be seen with the unaided eye. All right? And this is the great galaxy in Andromeda, M31. I said the greatest distance. Its distance is over two and a half million light years. So we're seeing this as it was two and a half million years ago. If you pronounce this correctly in Greek, it's Andromeda. Andromeda, yeah. Mm. Andromeda is how it should be, yeah. And it contains a trillion stars. And they've got worlds out there. So if you imagine someone really advanced up there with a, on a big gigantic telescope is looking at our galaxy. Or a much more efficient one. <laughs> even, and even if they could see us, of course, they wouldn't see you and me. They'd see the Earth as it was two and a half million years ago, right? But I have to tell you something, folks, which you may not be aware, but this gigantic galaxy is actually on a collision course with our galaxy. It's heading towards us, right? And that guy in the Andromeda galaxy is saying... <laughs> And this Milky Way galaxy is on a collision course with us. Yes, that's right. It really depends how you look at it. <laughs> exactly. Right. So, well, 
you know, in times to come, that's what your night sky is going to look like as and Andromeda gets closer and closer Pretty to Pretty fantastic. Us. <laughs> and then it's going to get even worse. This is actually a beautiful photograph taken by the, uh, not the Hubble, one, uh, I think it was the James Webb of the stars. You know, as, as we begin to see the stars of Andromeda, they will cover the entire skies with stars so it's as bright as daylight, all right? However, don't worry too much, folks. Because as I mentioned, it is two and a half uh, million light years away. And though it's moving quite rapidly towards us, it's not going to reach us for over another four billion years. Okay. <laughs> By that time, uh, this is what we think is going to happen. Okay, so the Milky Way, there's the Andromeda galaxy, right? And let's see if we can see what's going to happen. This is, all, this is simply a, a computer simulation, all right? Of what's going to happen it is based on observations though. oh yeah 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 observations of different stages of yeah. this process out there in the universe bang that's what's going to have to happen yeah. to us so bo both galaxies are going to be torn apart and then eventually most of it will begin to come back together again to form some other cyst giant system yeah probably two black holes will combine won't they at the yeah. center yeah and lots of others as well so that that's what we've got in store but as i mentioned earlier that's not going to happen for at least another four billion years and by that time the earth will probably be, be like the image you can see on this tv screen at the moment because by that time our sun will have turned into a red giant and the it would have become maybe a hundred times brighter than it is at the moment and um, the oceans of the earth will have boiled away and the atmosphere will have been driven off into space so the earth will be a pretty horrendous place so if the ancestors of human beings are still anywhere <laughs> somewhere else in the galaxy they, they would see that big collision taking place but it won't be from planet earth all right <laughs> they'd have to be outside our galaxy <laughs> yeah a bit yeah. of luck here so there you go okay so now the interesting thing is above the in the southern hemisphere looking up high above the southern cross we've got the two magellanic clouds and these are satellite galaxies of the milky way galaxy right and they're absolutely awesome things to observe so just same the same as a star has planets big galaxies have little galaxies traveling around them and there is furious star production taking place inside these Magellanic clouds. The large cloud is 158,000 light years away, contains 30 billion stars. The small cloud is much smaller, 7 billion stars. Its distance is more greater, 203,000 light years. But the interesting thing is that when we look at the comp composition of the stars and that, they appear to match up more with the Andromeda galaxy Andromeda galaxy, sorry, okay, than they do with their own. And the suggestion is that these these two were formed when a, a near collision between the Milky Way and Andromeda occurred in the past and ripped stuff off, and this is some of the material left over. And so now there's, the Andromeda's moved away from us, but now the galaxies are swarming to come back towards each other. So we're, maybe we're looking at bits of Andromeda from here. Our galaxy is pulling on them, isn't it? Which is creating that that pinky um, patches, which is starburst regions. Oh yeah, oh, mm. yeah, absolutely, yeah. Massive. There's kind there, of a thread of, of matter, isn't there, coming oh, towards the galaxy? There's a massive to amount of star form. Our galaxy. Well, we'll have a look at these mm. these Magellanic clouds in a later program. Okay. Now, just to finish off with, folks, you can to see them about, there. Yeah. One's yeah. up by the yes of Star Trek, and the other ones between yeah. the writing and the hinge yeah that's a photograph taken of both mm. uh, stonehenge now if you want to see these all these things in person you want a tour around the stars just looking and picking out the different stars and constellations and the milky way and so on we do do what we call star treks at stonehenge Artura, but these have to be booked all right and they're done with laser a laser yeah, a laser mm. tour of uh, mm. Of so they're going. showing you what you can see so you can go yeah. and do that yeah. that night yeah. the next night the yeah. night after that 
And at mm. the moment, Stonehenge is open for j daily visits from 10 o'clock to 4, p 4 o'clock, Wednesday through to Sunday, plus any school holidays, all right? We close Mondays and Tuesdays, that's our, normally our two days off, but private bookings can be done at any time or on any date, okay? And that so, includes those yeah. nighttime ones. Yeah. And as we head towards Christmas, I should pinch it, point out to you, we've got something else special coming up, which is the Star of Bethlehem. And we're going to be doing a special presentation. What was the star of Bethlehem? What are the legends behind it? You might be surprised to find out what scientists have found out about this star. Now, this is going to be starting at 7.30pm on Friday, December the 22nd, just beforehand. And I would say to you, again, you need to book. So uh, get in touch with us and uh, book your place to find out what was the star of Bethlehem? It's not really a little kid story time, mm. but of course there are little kids that are only young, but they might as well be going on 30. And folks, that's it for us for now, and we'll be catching you up uh, in a few weeks' time for our next look as we move into the summer stars. <laughs> 